Question. What are the special remedies, means, or helps against the cherishing or keeping up of any special or particular sin, either in heart or life, against the Lord, or against the light and conviction of a man's own conscience? Before I come to the resolution of this question, I shall premise a few things that may clear my way. Number one. When men's hearts are sincere with God, when they don't indulge, cherish, or keep up any known transgression in their hearts or lives against the Lord, they may, on very good grounds, plead an interest in God, Christ, and the covenant of grace, though their corruptions may sometimes prevail against them, defeating them too frequently, and leading them captive is as most evident in these special scriptures. Second Samuel 23, verse 5. Psalm 65, verse 3. Romans, chapter 7, verses 23 through 25. Isaiah, chapter 63, verses 16 through 17 and 19. Jeremiah, chapter 14, verses 7 through 9. And Hosea, chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. And verse 8. But when any man's heart condemns him for dealing deceitfully and guilefully with God in some particular instance, or for conniving or winking at any known transgression that is kept up, either in his heart or life against the Lord and against the light of his own conscience, which he will not let go nor in good earnest use the means whereby it should be subdued and mortified, <coughs> Excuse me. it is not to be expected that such a person can come to any clearness or satisfaction about their interest in Christ, the covenant of grace, and their right to the great things of that other world. When a person dallies with sin and would play with snares and baits, allowing a secret liberty in his heart to sin by conniving at many wonderings of it, and not setting upon mortification with earnest endeavors. Though he may be convinced, yet he is not persuaded to rise up with all his might against the Lord's enemies. He does his work negligently, which is an accursed thing. And for this... God casts such a person into sore straits and lets him wander in the darkness without any sight, sense, or assurance of his gracious estate or interest in Christ. The Israelites should have driven out the Canaanites completely, but because they did it by halves and did not engage all their power and strength against them, Therefore, God left them to be as, quote, thorns in their eyes and as goads in their sides, close quote. Numbers chapter 33 of verse 55. And so also, when men have taken Christ's press money and have pledged to fight with all their might against the rebels that war against him in their hearts, ways, and walkings, and to pursue the victory to the utmost until their spiritual enemies lie dead at their feet, and yet they merely trifle and make slender opposition against their sins, well, this provokes God to stand far off and to hide his reconciled face from them. It is true that when men are really in Christ, they should not question their state in him. But a guilty conscience will be clamorous and full of objections, and God will not speak peace to it until it is humbled at his feet. God will make his dearest children to know that it is a bitter thing to be bold with sin. Now, before I lay down the remedies, give me leave to show you what it is to indulge in sin or when a man may be said to indulge, 
cherish, or keep up any known transgression in his soul against the Lord. And for a clearer understanding of this point, consider the following. Number one. First, to indulge sin or to cherish it is to make daily provision for it. Romans chapter 13 verse 14. It is to nurse the sin, feeding and nourishing it as parents feed and indulge a sick or darling child. It must have what it will and do what it will. It must not be crossed. And when men are ordinarily, habitually, and commonly studious and laborious to make provision for their sin, they are said to indulge in that sin. Number two. Secondly, when sin is commonly and habitually sweet and pleasant to the soul, when a man takes daily pleasure and delight in his sin, then he is said to indulge in sin. You read of those that had, quote, pleasure in unrighteousness, close quote, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 12, that, quote, their soul delighteth in their abominations, close quote, Isaiah chapter 66, verse 3, that they are those who, quote, rejoice to do evil, close quote, Proverbs uh, chapter 2, verse 14, and so forth. Number three, thirdly, when men commonly and habitually side with sin, taking up arms in the defense of sin and in defiance of the commands of God, the motions of the Spirit, the checks of conscience, and the reproves of others, their sin is said to be indulged in. Number four. Fourthly, when men ordinarily and habitually yield a quiet, free, willing, and total subjection to the authority and commands of sin, then sin is indulged in. That man is completely addicted and devoted to the service of sin. Now, in none of these senses does any godly man indulge in any one sin in his soul. Though sin lives in him, yet it does not, or yet he does not live in sin. Every man that has drink in him is not drunk. A child of God may slip into a sin, even as a sheep may slip into the mire. But he does not wallow in that sin as swine do in the mire. Nor does he keep on in a road of sin as sinners do. In other words, he's saying that sin isn't a style of life. Quote, See if there be any way of wickedness in me. Close quote. Psalm 139 verse 24. Making a trade of sin is not consistent with the truth or state of grace. Quote, Thou knowest that I am not wicked. Close quote. Job chapter 10 verse 7. He does not say, You know that I am not a sinner, or You know that I have not sinned. No. For though the best of saints are still sinners, yet the worst and weakest of saints are not wicked. Every real Christian is a renewed Christian, and every renewed Christian takes his designation from his renovation, and not from the remainders of the corruptions within him. Therefore, such a person may look God in the face and say, quote, Lord, thou knowest that I am not wicked. I may be charged with weakness, but not with wickedness. Close quote. And certainly the man who dares to appeal to God that he is not wicked gives a strong demonstration of his own uprightness. That no godly man can indulge himself in any coarse way, 
or trait of sin may be made evident first that he does not sin with allowance when he does evil he disallows of the evil he does quote for that which I do I allow not Romans chapter 7 verse 15 a Christian is sometimes whirled away and caught up in a sin before he's aware of it or before he has time to consider it see Psalm 119 verses 1 through 3 first John chapter 3 verse 9 and Proverbs 16 verse 12 number two secondly a godly man hates all known sin quote I hate every false way close quote Psalm 119 verse 128 true hatred is hatred against the whole kind the opposition to sin which is in a real Christian springs from an inward gracious nature or principle and so it is opposed to the whole species of sin that is every kind of sin and is altogether irreconcilable to any sin as the contrarieties of nature are to the whole kind for example light is contrary to all darkness and fire to all water well, so also this contrariety to sin which arises from the inward man is universally opposed to all sin he who hates a toad because it is a toad hates every toad he who hates a godly man because he is godly he hates every godly man and so on he who hates sin because it is sin hates every sin quote what I hate that do I close quote Romans chapter 7 verse 15 number three thirdly every godly man is eager to have his sins not only pardoned but also destroyed his heart is alienated from his sins and therefore nothing will serve him or satisfy him but the blood and death of his sins Isaiah chapter 2 verse 20 Isaiah chapter 30 verse 22 Hosea chapter 14 verse 8 Romans chapter 8 verse 24 Saul hated David and sought his life Haman hated Mordecai and sought his destruction Absalom hated Amnon and killed him Julian the apostate hated Christians and put many thousands of them to death the great thing that a Christian has an eye to in all the duties he performs and in all the ordinances that he attends is the blood death and ruin of his sins number four fourthly every godly man groans under the burden of sin quote for we that are in this tabernacle do groan being burdened close quote second Corinthians chapter 5 verse 4 never did any potter groan more to be delivered from his heavy burden than a Christian groans to be delivered from the burden of his sin the burden of affliction the burden of temptation the burden of desertion the burden of opposition the burden of persecution the burden of scorn and contempt these are nothing in comparison to the burden of sin ponder upon Psalm 38 verse 4 40 verse 12 and also Romans chapter 7 verse 24 number five fifthly every godly man combats and conflicts with all known sin in every gracious soul there is a constant and perpetual conflict the flesh is continually lusting against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh Galatians chapter 5 verse 17 Romans chapter 7 verses 22 and 23 first Kings chapter 14 verses 30 through 31 
Though sin and grace were not born together, and though sin and grace shall never die together, yet while a believer lives in this world, they must unfortunately live together. And while sin and grace cohabitate together, they will be continually opposing and conflicting with one another. Number six. Sixthly, every gracious heart is continually crying out against his sins. He cries out to God to subdue them. He cries out to Christ to crucify them. He cries out to the Holy Spirit to mortify them. He cries out to faithful ministers to arm him against them. And he cries out to sincere Christians that they would pray hard that he might be made victorious over them. Now certainly it is a sure sign that sin has not gained a man's heart, love, or consent, but has instead committed rape upon his soul when he cries out bitterly against his sin. Recall that under the law, if a virgin cried out while being raped, she was guiltless. Deuteronomy chapter 22 verses 25 through 27. Certainly those who cry out against their sins, who would not indulge themselves in a way of sin for all the world, they are guiltless before the Lord. That which a Christian does not indulge himself in, he does not do in divine account. Number seven. Seventhly, the fixed purposes and designs of a godly man are not to sin. Quote, I am purposed that my mouth shall not transgress, close quote, at Psalm 17, verse 3, and that is to say, I have laid my design so as not to sin, though I may have many particular failings, yet my general purpose is not to sin. I said, I will take heed to my ways, that I sin not with my tongue, I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. Psalm 39, verse 1. Whenever a godly man sins, he sins against the general purpose of his soul. David laid a law upon his tongue. He uses three words in the first and second verses to the same purpose, which is as if he should say in plain English, I was silent. I was silent, I was silent. And all this expresses how he kept his anger in check so that he might not offend with his tongue. Though a godly man sins, yet he does not intend to sin. For his intentions are fixed against sin. Holiness is his highway. And as sin is itself a byway, as so it is beside his way. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 17. The honest traveler intends to keep straight on his way. And if at any time he strays from the way, he misses his purpose. Though Peter denied Christ, yet he did not intend to deny Christ. Yea, the settled intention of his soul was rather to die with Christ than to deny him. Quote, Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Close quote. Matthew chapter 26, verse 35. And interpreters agree that Peter meant what he said. Number eight. Eighthly, the settled resolution of a gracious heart is not to sin. Quote, I have sworn, and I will perform it, that I will keep thy righteous judgments. Close quote. Psalm 119, verse 106. 
Consider also Nehemiah, chapter 10, verses 28 through 31, and also Job, chapter 31, verse 1. Quote, For all people will walk, every one in the name of his God, and we walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. Close quote. Micah chapter 4, verse 5. And so did Daniel and the three children. Hooper resolves rather to be discharged of his bishopric than to yield to certain ceremonies. Jerome writes of a brave woman who, being upon the rack, bid her persecutors to do their worst, for she was resolved that she would rather die than lie. The Prince of Condé, being taken prisoner by Charles IX of France, and put this to choice, or and put to this choice, first, whether he would go to Mass, or second, be put to death, or thirdly, suffer perpetual imprisonment, he answered, quote, As for the first, by the assistance of God's grace, I will never do it, that is, go to Mass. And as for the other two, that is, to be put to death or suffer perpetual imprisonment, let the king do with me what he pleases, for I am very much assured that God will turn it all to the best. Close quote. Quote, the heavens shall as soon fall, close quote, said William Flower, to the bishop that persuaded him to save his life by retracting, quote, as I will forsake the opinion and faith I am in by God's assistance, close quote. Marcus Arethusius chose rather to suffer a most cruel death than to give one half penny towards the building of an idol temple. That is, idol is I-D-O-L. Cyprian, while on the way to his execution, was told by the emperor, quote, Now I give you an opportunity to consider whether you will obey me in casting a grain of frankincense into the fire, or to be miserably slain, close quote. Quote, nay, close quote, he replied, quote, I do not need time to deliberate in this case, close quote. And there are many thousands of similar instances scattered up and down in history. Number nine, ninthly. There is a real willingness in every gracious soul to be rid of all sin. Romans chapter 7 verse 24, Hosea chapter 14 verses 2 and 8, Job chapter 7 verse 21. Saving grace makes a Christian as willing to leave his sin as a slave is willing to leave his galley, or a prisoner his dungeon or a thief his bolts, or a beggar his rags. Quote, Many a day have I sought death with tears, close quote, says Blessed Cooper. Quote, Not out of impatience, distrust, or perturbation, but because I am weary of sin and fearful of falling into it. Close quote. As the daughters of Heth even made Rebekah weary of her life, Genesis chapter 27, verse 46. So, corruptions within a gracious soul, or corruptions within, make a gracious soul weary of his life. A gracious soul looks upon sin with as evil and as envious an eye as Saul looked on David when the evil spirit was upon him. Oh, says Saul, that I was but once well rid of this David. And oh, says a gracious soul, that I was but once well rid of this proud heart, this hard heart, this unbelieving heart, this unclean heart, this earthy heart, this obstinate heart of mine. Number 10. Tenthly, every godly man complains of his known sins and mourns over his known sins 
and would eagerly be rid of his known sins. And this is made evident by scores of scriptures. Job chapter 7 verse 21, Psalm 51 verse 14, and Hosea 2. 11. Eleventhly, every gracious soul sets himself resolutely, valiantly, and habitually against his special sins. That is, the sins that he's predisposed to, his most prevalent sins. Quote, I was also upright before him, and I kept myself from mine iniquity. Close quote. Psalm 18, verse 23. Certainly, that which is the special sin of a godly man is his special burden. It is not delighted in, but rather it is lamented. There is no sin which costs him so much sorrow as that to which either the temper of his body or the occasions of his life lead him. He sets his heart, his whole soul, most against the sin which he finds his heart most set upon. The scripture gives much evidence that David, though a man after God's own heart, was very apt to fall into the sin of lying. He used many unlawful shifts. We read of his often faltering in this when he was in difficult circumstances. 1 Samuel 21, verses 2 and 8. 1 Samuel 27, verses 8 and 10. But it is as clear in Scripture that his heart was set against lying, and that it was the grief and daily burden of his soul. Certainly that sin is a man's greatest burden and grief, which he prays most to be delivered from. Oh, how earnestly did David pray to be delivered from the sin of lying. Quote, Keep me from the way of lying. Close quote. Psalm 119, verse 29. And as he prayed earnestly against lying, so he as earnestly detested it. Quote, I hate and abhor lying. Close quote. Psalm 119, verse 163. Though lying was David's special sin, yet he hated and abhorred it, as he did hell itself. And he tells us how he was affected, or rather afflicted, by that sin. Quote, My life is spent with grief, and my years with sighings. My strength faileth, and my bones are consumed. Close quote. Psalm 31, verse 10, or moth eaten these are deep expressions of a troubled spirit. And why all this? He gives you the reason for it in the same verse, quote, because of mine iniquity, close quote. It is as if he had said, quote, there is, or it is as if he had said, there is a base corruption which so haunts and dogs me that my life is spent with grief and my years with sighing. It seems that he found his heart running out to some sin or another, which was so far from being a beloved sin, a bosom sin, a darling sin, that it was the breaking of his heart and the consumption of his bones. And the same is seen in Psalm 38, verse 18, quote, I will declare mine iniquity. I will be sorry for my sin, close quote. There is no sin that a gracious heart is more perfectly set against than his special sin. For by this sin, first, God has been most dishonored. Second, Christ most crucified. Third, the Holy Spirit most grieved. Fourth, the conscience most wounded. Fifth, Satan most advantaged. Sixth, 
mercies most embittered. Seventh, duties most hindered. Eighth, fears and doubts most raised and increased. Ninth, afflictions most multiplied. And tenth, death made most formidable and terrible. Therefore he breaks out against this sin with the greatest detestation and abhorrence. Ephraim's special sin was idolatry. Hosea chapter 4 verse 17. He thought the finest gold and silver in the world were hardly good enough to construct his idols from. But when it was the day of the Lord's gracious power upon Ephraim, then he thought no place was bad enough to cast his choicest idols into. And CF uh, Hosea 14 verse 8, Isaiah chapter 2 verse 20, and Isaiah chapter 30 verse 22. True grace will make a man stand stoutly and steadfastly on God's side, moving the heart to take part with him against that man's special sins, though they may be as dear to him as a right hand or a right eye. See Matthew chapter 5 verses 29 and 30. True grace will lay hands upon a man's special sins and cry out to heaven, Lord, crucify them, crucify them. Down with them, down with them, even to the ground. Lord, do justice, speedy justice. Do exemplary justice. Make an example of these special sins of mine. Lord, cut down root and branch. Let the very stumps of this Dagon be broken all to pieces. Lord, curse this wild fig tree so that fruit may never grow upon it again. Or twelve. Twelve. There is no time in which a gracious soul cannot sincerely say with the apostle in Hebrews chapter 13 verse 18, quote, Pray for us, for we trust we have a good conscience in all things willingly to live honestly. Close quote. Gracious hearts affect that which they cannot effect. Let me read that again. Gracious hearts affect that which they cannot effect. Quote. And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense towards God and toward men, close quote. Acts chapter 24, verse 16. In all cases, in all places, by all means and at all times. A sincere Christian labors to have a good conscience which is void of offense toward God and men. Quote, the highway of the upright is to depart from evil, close quote. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 17. That is, it is the ordinary, usual, and constant course of an upright man to depart from evil. An honest traveler may step out of the king's highway into a house, a wood, or an alley, but his work and business is to go on in the king's highway. And so also, the work and business of an upright man is to depart from evil. It is possible for an upright man to step into a sinful path or to find himself in a sinful situation. But his main way, his principal work and his business, is to depart from iniquity. A bee may land upon a thistle, but her work is to gather from the flowers. A sheep may slip into the dirt, but its work is to graze upon the mountains or in the meadows. Number 13. Thirteenth and lastly, Jesus Christ is the real Christian's only beloved. 
He is the Saints only darling. That's Saints uh, with an apostrophe is to make it individual. The Saints only darling. Quote, As the apple tree among the trees of the wood, so is my beloved among the sons. Close quote. Canticles, chapter 2, verse 3. Quote, The voice of my beloved, behold, he cometh, leaping upon the mountains and skipping upon the hills. That's verse 8. My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. Verse 9. My beloved spake and said unto me, Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. Verse 10. Turn, my beloved, and be thou like a roe or a young heart upon the mountains of beth -ir. That's verse 17. Let my beloved come into his garden and eat his pleasant fruits. That's uh, Canticles chapter 4, verse 16. Christ is called, quote, the beloved of his spouse, close quote, seven times in the fifth chapter of the Canticles. That is the Song of Solomon. Twice in the sixth chapter, four times in the seventh chapter, and once in the eighth chapter. Christ is called the church's beloved 20 times in the Song of Solomon. And I could direct you to many other scriptures, yet in the mouth of 20 witnesses, you may be very clearly and fully satisfied that Jesus Christ is the saint's beloved. And that saints has the apostrophe at the end to include all the saints. Letter A. When the Dutch martyr Killian was asked whether he loved his wife and children, he answered, quote, Were all the world a lump of gold, and it was in my hand to spend it, I would leave it all at my enemy's feet to live with my wife and my children, though it were but in a prison. Yet Christ is dearer to me than all, close quote. Letter B. Jerome said, quote, If my father should stand before me, and if my mother should hang upon me, and my brethren should press about me, I would break through my brethren, throw down my mother, and tread my father underfoot, so that I might cling more firmly and closely to the Lord Jesus Christ. Close quote. Letter C. That blessed virgin described in Basel, being condemned for Christianity to the fire, and having her estate and life offered to her if she would worship idols, cried out, quote, Let money perish and life vanish. Christ is better than all, close quote. Letter D. Love made Jerome say, quote, Oh, my Savior, did you die because of your love for me? a love more sorrowful than death, but to me, a death more lovely than love itself. I cannot live, love you, and be kept any longer from you. Close quote. Letter E. Henry Vowies said, quote, If I had ten heads, they should all be cut off for Christ. Letter F. The martyr John Ardley said, quote, if every hair of my head were a man, they should all suffer for the faith of Christ. Close quote. Letter G. Ignatius said, quote, Let fire, racks, pulleys, yea, and all the torments of hell come upon me, so long as I may win Christ. Close quote. Letter H. When the wife and children of George Carpenter stood before him, weeping shortly before his martyrdom, and he was asked whether or not he loved them, he answered, quote, My wife and children are dearer to me than all of Bavaria. Yet, for the love of Christ, I know them not. Close quote. Letter I. Quote, oh, Lord Jesus, close quote, said Bernard, quote, I love you more than all my goods. I love you more than all my friends, yea, 
I love you more than my very self, close quote. Letter J. Augustine said he would willingly go through hell to get to Christ. Letter K. Another said he would rather be in his chimney corner with Christ than in heaven without him. Letter L. Another cries out, quote, I would rather have one Christ than a thousand worlds, close quote. By all this, it is most evident that Jesus Christ is the saint's best beloved and not some particular sin. And by these 13 arguments, it is most clear that no gracious Christian can indulge himself in any trade, course, or way of sin. Yea, by these 13 arguments, it is most evident that no godly man has or can have any one beloved sin, any one bosom darling sin, though many worthy ministers make a great noise about the saints' beloved sins, their bosom darling sins, both in their preaching and writings. Well, I readily grant that all unregenerate people have their beloved sins, their bosom sins, their darling sins, but that no such sins are chargeable upon the regenerate is sufficiently demonstrated by the 13 arguments just cited. And, oh, that this were wisely and seriously considered by ministers and Christians alike. There is no known sin that a godly man is not troubled by, and that he would not eagerly be rid of. There is as much difference between sin in a regenerate person and in an unregenerate person, as there is between poison in a man and poison in an asp. Poison in a man's body is most offensive and burdensome, and he readily uses all methods and antidotes to expel it and be rid of it. But poison in an asp is in its natural place, and there it is most pleasing and delightful. And so also, sin in a regenerate man is most offensive and burdensome, and he readily uses all holy means and antidotes to expel it and get rid of it. But sin in an unregenerate man is most pleasing and delightful to him because it is in its natural place. A godly man continues to enter his protest against sin. A gracious soul hates the sin he commits while he's committing it. Oh, beloved, there is a vast difference between a special sin and a beloved, darling, and bosom sin. Noah had a special sin. Lot had a special sin. Jacob had a special sin. Job had a special sin. And David had a special sin. But none of these had any sin which was to them a beloved, bosom, or darling sin. In Job, chapter 31, verse 33, we read the words, quote, If I covered my transgression, as Adam, by hiding mine iniquity in my bosom, close quote. Notice in this text that while Job called some sin or another his iniquity, yet he denies that he had any beloved sin, for he says, Did I hide it in my bosom? Did I show it any favor? Did I cherish it or nourish it or keep it warm in my bosom? Oh, no, I did not. And thus, a godly man may have many sins, yet he does not have one beloved sin, one bosom sin, one darling sin. And that's not three sins that Brooks is talking about. He's just using three words, beloved, bosom, and darling. He doesn't have that one <clears throat> sin. 
He may have some particular sin to which the unregenerate part of his will may be strongly inclined, and to which his unmortified affections may run to with violence. Yet, he has no sin that he bears any good will or cordial affection to. Note, though it may be called a man's particular way of sinning, yet we cannot call it his beloved sin, his bosom sin, his darling sin. For it may be his greatest grief and torment, and may cost him more sorrow and tears than all the rest of his sins put together. It is more akin to a tyrant usurping power over him than the delight and pleasure of his soul. A godly man may be more prone to fall into one sin than another. It may be anger, pride, slavish fear, worldliness, hypocrisy, or some other vanity. Yet these are not his beloved sins, his bosom sins, his darling sins. For they are the enemies that he hates and abhors. They are the grand enemies that he strives against, complains of, and mourns over. They are the powerful rebels that his soul cries out against the most, and by which his soul suffers the greatest violence. Mark this, no sin but Christ is the dearly beloved of a Christian soul. Christ, and not this or that sin, is the, quote, chiefest of ten thousand, close quote, to a gracious soul. And yet, some particular corruption may defeat a believer more frequently than another leading him captive. But the believer cries out most against this particular sin. Oh, he says, this is my iniquity. This is the Saul, the Pharaoh, that is always pursuing the blood of my soul. Lord, let this Saul fall, uh, fall by the sword of thy spirit. Let this Pharaoh be drowned in the Red Sea of thy son's blood. It is a point of very great importance for gracious souls to understand the vast difference between a beloved sin and some particular sin which violently tyrannizes the believer. It is most certain that the man who gives himself up freely, willingly, cheerfully, and habitually to the service of any one particular lust or sin, this man is in the state of nature, under wrath and is on the way to eternal ruin. Now to show the vanity, folly, and falsehood of the notion that is commonly avowed by ministers and Christians alike, namely that every godly person has his beloved sin, his bosom sin, his darling sin, Give serious consideration to the following particulars. Number one, first, this opinion is not grounded in or founded upon any clear scripture, either in the Old or New Testament. Second, this opinion runs counter cross to the 13 arguments not just now alleged and to all the scores of plain scriptures by which those arguments are, conf uh, are confirmed. Third, this opinion has a great tendency to harden and strengthen wicked men in their sins. For when they hear it said that the saints, the dearly beloved of God, have their beloved bosom and darling sins, what inferences are they then ready to make? What are these whom they call saints? Well, how are they better than us? Do we have our own beloved sins? Well, so did they. Do we have our own bosom sins? Well, so did they. Do we have our own darling sins? Well, so did they. They had their beloved sins, and yet were beloved of God. And why may not we also? Saints have their beloved sins, and yet God is kind to them. Why should the same not also apply to us? 
Saints have their beloved sins, and yet God will save them. Why then should we believe that God will damn us? Saints have their beloved sins, their bosom sins, their darling sins, and therefore certainly they are not to be so dearly loved or highly prized and greatly honored as ministers would make us to believe. Saints have their beloved sins, their bosom sins, their darling sins, and therefore what iniquity is it to account and call them hypocrites, deceivers, and liars? For they pretended to have a great deal of love for God, Christ, his word, and his ways. And yet, for all this, they have their beloved sins, their bosom sins, their darling sins. Surely these men's hearts are not right with God. And so the thinking goes. Number four. Fourthly, if Christ really is the saints beloved, then their sin is not their beloved. But Christ is the saints beloved, as I have just clearly proved, and therefore sin cannot be their beloved. A man may as well serve two masters as have two beloveds, namely, a beloved Christ and a beloved lust. See Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Number five. Fifth, the supernatural graces, that is, the divine qualities that are infused into the soul at first conversion, are contrary and opposite to all sin, and they engage the heart against all sin. Therefore, a converted person can have no beloved sin, no bosom sin, no darling sin weigh this argument seriously. Number six. Sixthly, this opinion may fill many weak Christians with needless fears, doubts, and jealousies about their spiritual and eternal condition. Weak Christians are very apt to reason along these lines. Quote, Surely my conversion is not sound. My spiritual state is not good. My heart is not right with God. A saving work has never passed upon me in power. I fear I have not the root of the matter in me. I fear I have never had a thorough change. I fear I have never been effectually called out of darkness and into his marvelous light. I fear I have never been espoused to Christ. I fear the Spirit of God has never taken up my heart for his habitation. I fear that after all my high professions, I shall in the end be found a hypocrite. I fear the execution of that dreadful sentence. Quote, Go away, ye cursed, close quote, Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. And, I, and why all this? Oh, poor soul, do not answer, because I carry about with me my beloved sins, my bosom sins, my darling sins. And that's to close that train of thought. <laughs> Ministers should be very wary. Wary, not weary. Wary that they do not bring forth fuel to feed the fears and doubts of weak Christians in their preaching and their writings. For it is a great part of their work to arm weak Christians against their fears and weaknesses. Number seven. This opinion is one that is very repugnant to sound and sincere repentance. For sound, sincere repentance includes a divorce, an alienation, a detestation, a separation, and a turning from all sin, without exception or reservation. One of the first works of the Spirit upon the soul is the dividing between all known sin and the soul. It makes an utter breach between all sin and the soul. 
It is a dissolving of the fellowship that had been between a sinner and his sins. Yea, between a sinner and his beloved lusts. One of the first works of the Spirit is to make a man look upon all his sins as his enemies, yea, his greatest enemies, and to deal with his sins as such, hating and loathing them, fearing them, and taking up arms against them. Well, seriously consider these scriptures. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 28, and also verses 30 through 31. Ezekiel the entire sixth chapter. Second Corinthians chapter seven verse one. Psalm one hundred nineteen verses one hundred one, one hundred four, and one hundred and twenty eight. True repentance is a turning from all sin, without any reservation or exception. He whose heart is not turned from every sin has never truly repented of any sin. The true penitent casts off all the rags of the old Adam. He strives to throw down every stone of the old building. He will not leave a horn nor hoof behind. The reasons for turning from sin are universally binding to a penitent soul. There are the same reasons and grounds for a penitent man's turning from every sin as there is for his turning from any one sin. Do you turn from this or that particular sin because the Lord has forbidden it? You must therefore turn from every sin upon the same grounds. For God has forbidden every sin, not just this or that particular sin. In the same authority forbids and commands in all. And if the authority of God prohibits a man from one sin, it will prohibit him from them all. He that turns from any one sin because it is a transgression of the holy and righteous law of God, he will turn from every sin upon the same account. He that turns from any one sin because it is a dishonor to God or approach to Christ, a grief to the spirit, and a wound to religion, will upon the same grounds turn from every sin. What does a true penitential turning from all sin consist of? I'll answer in these six things. First, in the alienation, inward aversion, and drawing off of the soul from the love and liking of all sin, and from all free and voluntary subjection unto sin, the heart being filled with a loathing and detestation of all sin. Psalm 119, verses 104 and 128 regarding it as that which is most contrary to all goodness and happiness. Second, in the will's loathing and hatred of all sin. When the very bent and inclination of the will is set against all sin, opposes and crosses all sin, and is set upon the ruin and destruction of all sin, then the penitent is turned from all sin. Romans 7, verse, uh, chapter 7, verse 15, 19, 21, and 23. Isaiah, chapter 30, verse 22. And Hosea, chapter 14, verse 8. When the will stands in defiance of all sin in such a way that it will never enter into a league of friendship with any sin, then the soul is turned from every sin. Third. In the judgments turning away from all sin by disproving, disallowing, and condemning all sin. Romans chapter 7 verse 15. Oh, said the judgment of a Christian, sin is the greatest evil in all the world. It is the only thing God abhors. It brought Jesus Christ to the cross. It damns souls. It shuts heaven and it has laid the foundations of hell. 
It is the thorn pricking in my eye, the deadly arrow in my side, the two-edged sword that has wounded my conscience and slain my comforts, separating my soul from God. Sin is that which has hindered my prayers, embittered my mercies, and put a sting into all my crosses. Therefore, I cannot help but disapprove of it, disallow it, and condemn it to death. Yea, to hell from which it came. Fourth, in the purpose and resolution of the soul, the soul sincerely purposing and resolving to never willingly, willfully, or wickedly transgress any more. Psalm 17, verse 3. The general purpose and resolution of my heart is not to transgress. Though particular failings may attend me, yet my resolutions and purposes are firmly set against doing evil. Psalm 39, verse 1. The true penitent holds up his purposes and resolutions to keep himself away from sin and to keep himself near to God, though he may not be able to make good his purposes and resolutions in everything and at all times. Fifth, in the earnest and unfeigned desires and careful endeavors of the soul to abandon all sin, to forsake all sin, and to be rid of all sin. Romans chapter 7, verses 22 through 23. When a prudent, tender, compassionate father sees his child fail and come short in that which he directs him to do, if he knows that his child desires and endeavors to please him and serve him, he will not be harsh, rigid, sour, or severe toward him, but will spare him, exercising great tenderness and lenience toward him. And if so, then will the God, whose mercies reach above the heavens, whose compassion is infinite, and whose love is like himself, will he be more stern with his children than men are with theirs? Surely not. God's fatherly leniency accepts of the will for the work. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 18, and 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 12. Certainly a sick man is not more desirous to be rid of all his diseases, nor a prisoner to be freed from all his bolts and chains, than the true penitent is desirous to be rid of all his sins. Sixth and lastly, in the common and ordinary declining, shunning, and avoiding of all known occasions of sin, yea, and all the temptations, provocations, inducements, and enticements to sin. The royal law, quote, abstain from all appearance of evil, close quote, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22, is a law that is very precious in a penitent man's eye and commonly lies warm upon a penitent man's heart. And thus, under ordinary circumstances, you shall find him very ready to shun and avoid the very appearance of sin, the very shows and shadows of sin. Job made a covenant with his eyes, Job chapter 31, verse 1. And Joseph would not listen to his bold, tempting mistress to lie by her or to be with her. Genesis chapter 39, verse 10. David, when himself, would not sit with vain people. Psalm 26, verses 3 through 5. Now a true penitential turning from all sins lies in these six things. Therefore you must examine yourself. For if there is any way of wickedness in which you walk, in which you are resolved not to forsake, then you are no true penitent, and you will certainly lose your soul and be miserable forever.
Number eight. This notion is one that will exceedingly deject many precious Christians, causing them to hang down their heads, especially on these four days. The day of common calamity, the day of personal affliction, the day of death, and on the great day of account. Letter A. First, in the day of common calamity, when the sword is drunk with the blood of the slain, when the raging pestilence lays thousands in heap upon heap, or when fevers, chills, cramps, and other diseases carry hundreds every week to their graves. Now the remembrance of a man's beloved sins, his bosom sins, his darling sins, will be very likely to fill his soul with fear, dread, and perplexity. Surely now God will meet with me. Now God will avenge himself on me for my beloved sins, my bosom sins, my darling sins. Because of my beloved lusts, oh, how righteous a thing it is for God to sweep me away with these sweeping judgments that abound on the earth. Well, on the contrary, how sweet and comfortable a thing it is when in a day of common calamity, a Christian can appeal to God and conscience that though he has many weaknesses and infirmities that hang upon him, yet he has no beloved bosom or darling sin that either God or conscience can charge upon him. Oh, such a consideration as this may be like life from the dead to a gracious Christian in the midst of all the common calamities that surround him and that threaten him every hour. Letter B. Second, in the day of personal afflictions, when this smarting rod is upon him and God writes bitter things against him, when the hand of the Almighty has touched him in his name, estate, and relations, now the remembrance of a man's beloved sins, his bosom sins, his darling sins, they will be as the handwriting upon the wall that will make his countenance to be changed, his thoughts to be troubled, his joints to be loosed, and his knees to be dashed one against another. It's Daniel chapter 5, verses 5 through 6. Now a Christian will be ready to conclude, Oh, it is my beloved sins, my bosom sins, my darling sins that have caused God to put this bitter cup into my hand and that has provoked him to give me gall and wormwood to drink. Lamentations chapter 3 verse 19. Whereas on the contrary, when a man is under personal trials, though they are many and great, yet he can lift up his head and appeal to God and conscience, that though he has many sinful weaknesses and infirmities hanging upon him, yet neither God nor conscience can charge upon him any beloved bosom or darling sins. Oh, how the thought of this will help a man to bear up bravely, sweetly, cheerfully, patiently, and contentedly under the heaviest hand of God. And this is evident in the great example of Job, who was as sorely afflicted as Job. And yet no beloved bosom or darling sin was chargeable upon him by God or conscience. Job chapter 10 verse 7 and also Job 31 verse 33. How bravely, sweetly, and Christianly does Job bear up under those sad changes and dreadful providences that would have broken a thousand other men's hearts upon whom God and conscience could charge beloved bosom and darling sins. Let her see. Third, on the day of death. Death is, quote, the king of terrors, close quote, as Job calls it, Job chapter 18, verse 14, and, quote, the terror of kings, close quote, 
as the philosopher calls it. Oh, how terrible will this king of terrors be to the man upon whom God and conscience can charge the loved bosom and darling sins. For it is certain that when a wicked man comes to die, all the sins that he has ever committed will not grieve, terrify, sadden, and sink him. Raising such horrors and terrors in him, and putting him into such a hell on this side of hell as his beloved bosom and darling sins. And if the saints had beloved bosom and darling sins, then what a hell of horror and terror would these sins raise in their souls when they come to lie upon their dying beds. But when a child of God lies upon his dying bed, and is able to say, Lord, you know, and conscience, you know, that though I have had many and great failings, yet there are no beloved sins, no bosom sins, no darling sins that are chargeable upon me. Lord, you know, and conscience, you know, number one, that there is no known sin that I do not hate and abhor. Number two, that there is no known sin that I do not fight against and resist. Number three, that there is no known sin that I do not grieve and mourn over. Number four, that there is no known sin that would not presently, freely, willingly, and heartily be rid of. Number five, that there is no known sin that I do not endeavor in the use of holy means to be delivered from. And number six, that there is no known sin, the effectual subduing and mortifying of which would not administer matter of the greatest joy and comfort to me. Now, when God and conscience shall acquit a dying man of beloved bosom and darling sins, who can express the joy, the comfort, the peace, and support that such an acquaintance will fill that man with. Letter D. Fourth, on the day of account, the very thought of which to many is more terrible than death itself. For those Christians who are captivated by the power of this notion, that the saints have their beloved bosom and darling sins. They cannot help but to greatly fear and tremble at the thought of appearing before the tribunal of God. Oh, says such a poor heart, how shall I be able to answer for my beloved sins, my bosom sins, my darling sins? As for affirmities, weaknesses, and follies that have attended me, I can plead with God and tell him, Lord, when grace has been weak, corruption strong, temptations great, your spirit withdrawn, and I have been off my watch. I have been overcome and defeated. But what shall I say with regard to my beloved sins, my bosom sins, my darling sins? Oh, how they fill me with terror and horror. How shall I be able to hold up my head before the Lord when he reckons me for these sins? But when a poor child of God thinks of the day that account and is able through grace to say, Lord, though I cannot clear myself of infirmities and many sinful weaknesses, yet I can comfortably appeal to you and my conscience that I have no beloved sins, no bosom sins, no darling sins. Oh, with what comfort, confidence, and boldness will such poor hearts hold up their heads on the day of account when a Christian can plead these things before the judgment seat? Oh, how his fears will vanish and his hopes and heart be revived and how comfortably and confidently will he stand before the judgment seat. Number nine. Ninth, this notion 
There's a very great tendency to discourage and deaden the hearts of Christians to the most noble and spiritual duties of religion. Namely, number one, praising God. Number two, delighting in God. Number three, rejoicing in God. Number four, admiring God. Number five, finding full contentment and satisfaction in God. Number six, being a witness for God's truth, ordinances, and ways. Number seven, engaging in self-trial and self-examination. Number eight, making their calling and election sure. I cannot see how such souls can apply themselves to their eight duties with comfort, confidence, or courage if they lie under the power of this notion that saints may have their beloved bosom and darling sins. But when a Christian has a clear conscience and can clear himself, as every sincere Christian can, of beloved bosom and darling sins, then he stands upon the advantaged ground and can fall in roundly with all eight duties just mentioned. Number ten. Tenth, and lastly, this notion has a very great tendency to discourage multitudes of Christians from coming to the Lord's table. I would willingly know with what comfort, with what confidence, with what hope, with what expectation of good from God, or of good from the ordinance, can such souls draw near to the Lord's table who lie under the power of this notion or persuasion that they carry about with them their bosom sins, their beloved sins, their darling sins. How can such souls expect that God should meet with them in the ordinance and bless the ordinance to them? How can such souls expect that God should make this great ordinance to be strengthening, comforting, refreshing, establishing, and enriching unto them? How can such souls expect that in this ordinance God should seal up to them his eternal love, their interest in Christ, their right to the covenant, their title to heaven, and the remission of their sins when they bring to his table their beloved bosom and darling sins? But when the people of God draw near to the table of the Lord and can appeal to God that though they have many sinful failings and infirmities hanging upon them, yet they have no beloved bosom or darling sins that they carry along with them. How comfortably and confidently may they expect that God will make that great ordinance a blessing to them and that in time all these glorious ends for which that ordinance was appointed shall be accomplished in and upon them. Now, from these ten arguments, you may see the weakness and falseness, yea, the dangerous nature of this notion that many worthy men have preached, maintained, and printed to the world for so long, namely, that saints, or that the saints, have their beloved bosom and darling sins. Well, it's no surprise to me that they should be so sadly out in this particular, when I consider how apt men are to receive things by tradition, without bringing things to a strict examination. Now, though I have said enough, I suppose, to put to rest this notion that the saints have their beloved bosom and darling sins, Yet to close this issue, permit me to premise these five things. Number one, first, all unconverted persons have their beloved sins, their bosom sins, their darling sins. The beloved bosom and darling sin of the Jews was idolatry. The beloved bosom and darling sin of the Corinthians was uncleanness and wantonness. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 15 through 20. The beloved bosom and darling sin of the Cretans was lying. Titus chapter 1, verse 12. Jeroboam's beloved sin was idolatry. 
Cain's beloved sin was envy. Korah's beloved sin was arguing. Esau's beloved sin was profaneness. Ishmael's beloved sin was scoffing. Baalam's beloved sin was ambition. Simeon and Levi's beloved sin was treachery. Manasseh's beloved sin was cruelty. Nebuchadnezzar's beloved sin was pride. Herod's beloved sin was uncleanness. Judas, his beloved sin was covetousness. And the rich young man's beloved sin was worldly mindedness. Matthew chapter 19, verses 21 through 22. Number two. Second. Consider that the elect of God had their beloved sins before their conversion. Manasseh's beloved sin before his conversion was cruelty. Ephraim's beloved sin before conversion was idolatry. Hosea chapter 4 verse 17. Zacchaeus' beloved sin before conversion was worldly mindedness and the defrauding of others. Paul's beloved sin before conversion was persecution. The jailer's beloved sin before conversion was cruelty. And Mary Magdalene's beloved sin before conversion was wantonness and uncleanness. Number three. Third, consider that after conversion there is no sin that the heart of a Christian is more seriously, frequently, resolutely, and more perfectly set against than that which was once his beloved lust. The hatred, detestation, and indignation of a converted person breaks out and reveals itself most strongly against the sin which was once beloved, bosom, and darling to him. His care, fear, jealousy, and watchfulness are most exercised against the sin which was once the darling of his soul. The converted person's I this sin as an old enemy. He looks upon this sin as the sin by which God has been most dishonored, his own conscience most enslaved, his immortal soul most endangered, and Satan most advantaged, and his spirit rises against it accordingly. Hosea chapter 14 verse 8, Isaiah chapter 2 verse 20, and Isaiah chapter 30 verse 22. And all Christians' experience confirms this truth. Number four. Fourth. After conversion, a Christian endeavors to be most eminent in the particular grace which is most contrary and opposite to the sin which was once his beloved bosom and darling sin. Zacchaeus' beloved sin was worldliness and defrauding. But being converted, he labors to excel in restitution and generosity. The jailer's beloved sin was severity and cruelty. But being converted, he labors to excel in mercy and courtesy. Paul's beloved sin was persecution. But being converted, how mightily does he stir himself up to convert, edify, build up, strengthen, Establish and encourage souls in the ways of the Lord. He gives it you from his own hand that he, quote, labored more abundantly than they all, close quote. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. Before his conversion, Augustine's beloved bosom darling sin was wantonness and uncleanness. But when he was converted, he was most careful and watchful to arm himself against that sin and to avoid all temptations and occasions that might lead him to it afterwards. If a man's beloved sin before conversion was worldliness, then after conversion he will labor above all to excel in heavenly mindedness. If his beloved sin was pride, then he will labor above all to excel in humility. 
If his beloved sin was intemperance, then he will labor above all to excel in temperance and sobriety. If his beloved sin was wantonness and uncleanness, then he will labor above all to excel in all chastity and purity. If his beloved sin was oppressing others, then he will labor above all to excel in piety and compassion towards others. If his beloved sin was hypocrisy, then he will labor above all to excel in sincerity. Number five. Fifth. Though no godly man, no sincere, gracious Christian, has any beloved, bosom, and darling sin, yet there is no godly man that does not have some sin or another to which he is more prone to than others. Every real Christian has an inclination to one kind of sin or another, which may be called his special sin, his peculiar sin, or his own iniquity, as David speaks of in Psalm 18, verse 23. Now the power of grace and righteousness is chiefly seen and exercised in a man's keeping of himself from his iniquity. And that special, particular sin to which a gracious soul may be most prone and addicted to may arise, letter A, from the temperament and constitution of his body. The complexion and constitution of a man's body may make him, more, make him a more prepared instrument for one vice over another. Letter B, it may arise from his particular calling. Now, Christians have a distinct and particular calling that incline them to particular sins. For instance, this soldier's calling puts him upon pillaging and violence. Quote, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. Close quote. That's Luke chapter 3, verse 14. A tradesman's calling makes him prone to lying, deceiving, defrauding, and cheating his brother. The minister's calling predisposes him to flattering the wealthy and fashionable ones of his parish, and to pleasing the rest by speaking smooth words, Isaiah chapter 30, verse 10, and to, quote, sewing of the pillows under their elbows, close quote, Ezekiel chapter 13, verses 18 through 20. And the magistrates, judges, and justices' employments lay them open to oppression, bribery, injustice, and so forth. If Christians are not very much upon their watch, their very callings and offices may prove a very great snare to their souls. Letter C. It may arise from his outward state and condition in this world, whether his state is one of prosperity or adversity, or of one of marriage or bachelorhood. Many times a man's outward state and condition in the world has a strong influence upon his inclination to this or that particular sin, as it agrees with his condition. Letter D. It may arise from distinct and particular ages. For certain stages of life strongly incline people to distinct and particular sins. Youth inclines to wantonness and prodigality. Manhood to pride and ambition, and old age, to covetousness and stubbornness. Common experience tells us that many times wantonness is the sinner's darling in the time of his youth, and worldliness is darling in his middle age, so that without a controversy, a Christian stage of life more strongly inclines him to this or that sin over another. Letter E. It may arise from the distinct and particular manner of upbringing and education which he has had. Now, to arm such Christians against these special and particular sins, the sins that are advantaged against them, either by their constitution and complexion, their particular calling, their outward state and condition, their distinct and particular stage of life, or by, or by their particular manner of upbringing and education. And this is my present work and business. 
For though the reigning power of this or that particular sin is broken upon a man's conversion, yet the life and strength that remains in these corruptions will be improved by Satan against the growth, peace, comfort, and assurance of the soul. Satan will strive to enter in through the same door and by the same Delilah which by which he has betrayed and wounded the soul in the past. He will do all he can to do to the foul or to he will do all he can do to the soul further mischief by this avenue. Satan will continually remind the soul of these former sweetnesses, pleasures, profits, delights, and contentments that have come in upon the old score, so that it will be a hard thing, even for a godly man, to keep himself from his iniquity, from his special or particular sin, which the fathers commonly, though not truly, called Bacatium in Delicius, a man's special, darling, and beloved sin. Christian, remember this once and for all. Sound conversion includes a noble and serious revenge upon the sin which was once a man's beloved bosom and darling sin. Yea, what clearing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 11. You see this in Cranmer, who, when he had subscribed with his right hand to that which was against his conscience, Yet afterward, as holy revenge, he put his right hand into the flames first. And Mary Magdalene takes revenge upon her hair. Luke chapter 7, verses 37 and 38. That was used to attract other men into uncleanness. Of all sins, the sound convert says, I am resolved to be avenged on my once beloved bosom and darling sin by which I have most dishonored God, wronged my own precious and immortal soul, and by which I have most endangered my everlasting estate. Now, having thus cleared the way, I shall now endeavor to lay before you some special remedies, means, and helps against the cherishing or keeping up of any special or particular sin, either in heart or life, against the Lord or against the light and conviction of a man's own conscience. Number one, first, cherishing or keeping up any special or particular sin in heart or life, against the Lord or against the light and conviction of a man's own conscience, will hinder assurance in many ways. Letter A. First, it will weaken the strength of our graces, and, may, and so make them more indiscernible. Now the strength of grace is that which gives the clearest evidence of a gracious estate, of a man's interest in Christ. Sin, which is lived in, is like a blight to the tree. It destroys the fruit. Grace cannot thrive in a sinful heart. Plants will not grow in some soils. The cherishing of sin causes grace to wither. Casting a favorable eye upon a special sin hinders the growth of grace. If a man has a choice plant or flower in his garden, and it withers and shrivels and is dying, he opens the ground and looks at the root. And if he finds a worm there gnawing at the root, then this is the cause of the flowers fading. Well, the application is easy. Letter B. Second, the cherishing of any special or peculiar sin, or the keeping up of any known transgression against the Lord, and against the light of a man's own conscience, will hinder the lively function and exercise of grace. 
it will keep grace in a state of weakness, so that it will hardly be seen to stir or act. Yea, it will suppress grace to such a degree that it will hardly be heard to speak. When a special or particular sin is entertained, it will exceedingly mar the vigorous exercise of those graces which are the evidences of a lively faith and gracious state, and of a man's interest in Christ. Grace is never apparent and sensible to the soul, except while it is in action. Therefore, lack of action must by necessity cause a lack of assurance. Habits are not felt directly, but by the freeness and easiness of their acts, make them readily apparent. And of the very being of the soul itself, nothing is felt or perceived, but only its action. The fire that lies within the flint is neither seen nor felt, but when you strike it to the iron, forcing it into activity, it is easily discernible. For the most part, as long as a Christian has his graces in a state of lively action, he is assured of them. He that would be assured that this sacred fire of grace is in his heart must kindle it and fan it into a flame. Letter C. Third, the cherishing of any special sin or the keeping up of any known transgression in the heart or life against the Lord and against the light of a man's own conscience blurs, dims, and darkens the eye of the soul so that it cannot see its own condition or have any clear knowledge of its gracious state or of its interest in Christ. Sometimes when men are writing, they raise so much dust that they cannot see themselves or their dearest friends well enough to distinguish one from another, and the application of this is easy. Well, sometimes the room is so full of smoke that a man cannot see the jewels and other treasures that lie before him, and so it is here. Letter D. Fourth. The cherishing of any special or particular sin or the keeping up of any known transgression against the Lord or the light of conscience provokes the Lord to withdraw himself, his comforts, and the gracious presence and assistance of his blessed spirit, without which this soul may seek and search long for assurance, comfort, and a sight of a man's interest in Christ before it will enjoy the one or see the other. If by keeping up a known transgression against the Lord, you grieve the Holy Spirit, which alone can comfort you and assure you of your interest in Christ, you may walk without comfort and assurance for a long time. The comforter that should relieve my soul is far from me. Lamentations 1 verse 16. And 1 John 3, verse 21, it is supposed that a self-condemning heart voids a man's confidence before God. The precious jewel of faith can be held in no other place but a pure conscience, for it is the only royal palace in which it must and will dwell. Quote, Holding faith and a good conscience, close quote. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 19. Quote, Let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our, our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, close quote. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. He that comes to God with a true, honest, and upright heart, being sprinkled from an evil conscience, may draw near to God in full assurance of faith, whereas guilt clouds, clogs, and distracts the soul in such a way that it can never be with God as it would or should. Consentia pura sepersucura, or secura, 
good conscience has sure conscience. Conscience is mila testis, a thousand witnesses for or against a man. Conscience is God's preacher in the bosom. As Evagrius said, it is better to lie securely on a bed of straw than to have a turbulent conscience on a bed of down. It was a divine saying of Seneca, a heathen, that if there was no God to punish him, no devil to torment him, no hell to burn him, and no man to see him, yet would he not sin, because of the ugliness of sin, and the grief he would bring to his conscience. Letter E. Fifth. The cherishing of any special or particular sin, or the keeping up of any known transgression in heart or life against the Lord or the light of a man's own conscience will greatly hinder his high esteem of Jesus Christ, and thus will keep him from comfort, assurance, and the sight of his interest in him. So much that sometimes his dearest children are constrained to cry out, God is departed from me, and he answered me not, neither by dream nor vision, neither this way nor that. That's First Samuel chapter 28, verse 15. Letter F. Sixth, the greatest and most common cause of the lack of assurance, comfort, and peace is some unmortified lust, some secret, special, or particular sin which men entertain, or at least which they do not vigorously oppose and heartily renounce as much as they could or should. Hic ilie lachme, hence those tears, and this is that which casts them into sore straits and difficulties. And why should it be otherwise, seeing that God who is infinitely wise, holy, and righteous, seeing that God either cannot or will not reveal the secrets of his love to those who harbor his known enemies in their bosoms. The great God either cannot or will not regard the whinings and complainings of those who play or dally with the very sin which galls their consciences who connive and wink at the stirrings and workings of the very lust for which he hides his face from them, and writes bitter things against them. Job chapter 13, verse 26. All fears, doubts, and uneasiness are the offspring of sin, either real or imaginary. Now, if the sin is merely imaginary, an enlightened and rectified judgment may easily and quickly scatter such fears, doubts, and uneasiness, even as the sun does to mists and clouds when it shines in its brightness. But if the sin is real and actual, then there is no possibility of curing the fears, doubts, and uneasiness which arise from it, unless it is by unfeigned repentance, and returning from that sin. Unfeigned repentance and returning from that sin. Now, if I should attempt to produce all the scriptural instances that stand ready to prove this point, I would have to transcribe a good portion of the Bible. But this would be to labor in vain since this notion seems to have been a notion which is engraved on even the natural conscience, namely that sin so defiles a person that until he is washed from it, neither he nor his services can be accepted. The custom of setting water pots at the entrance to their temples or places of worship arose from this notion. Therefore, let him that lack assurance, comfort, peace, and a sight of his interest in Christ cast out every known sin and set upon a universal course of reformation. For God will not give his refreshments to those that have an upset stomach. And 
those that dally and tamper with this or that sin against the light and checks of conscience, those God will have no commerce or communion with. On such, God will not lift up the light of his countenance. Quote, To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone, and in that stone a new name written. Close quote. Revelation chapter 2 verse 17. These are all metaphorical expressions, which, being put together, do amount to as much as assurance. But notice that these are promised to him that overcometh, to him that rides on, conquering and to conquer. Oh, that Christians would seriously remember this. The more dearly it has cost a man to part with his sins, the more sweet and comfortable it will be to call to mind that victory that he has obtained over his sin through the Spirit of Grace. There is no comfort, joy, or peace to be found in that which arises from the conquests of sin. And this is especially true of beloved sins. When Goliath was slain, what joy and triumph was there in the camp? And so also the same is true here. Letter G. Seven. The cherishing of any special or particular sin or the keeping up of any known transgression against the Lord or the light of conscience, either in the heart or life, will hinder the soul from the warm, lively, fervent, frequent, seasonable, sincere, and constant way of duty that contributes most to the increase of grace peace, comfort, and assurance. Letter H. Eighthly, seriously consider the following assertions and concurrent judgments of our best and most famous divines in the present case. I shall give you a taste of some of their sayings. First, a man that favors and retains any one sin in himself against his conscience, can have no peace in his conscience. Second, regardless of whatever good deeds seem to be in him, a man is in a damnable state if he will not yield to the work of the Holy Spirit in leaving any known sin which fights against his peace of conscience. Third, as long as the power of mortification destroys your sinful affections, and as long as you are genuinely displeased with all sin, and you are mortifying the deeds of the body by the Spirit, your case is the case of salvation. Fourth, a good conscience does not stand with the purpose of sinning. No, not with irresolution against sin. This must be understood of habitual purposes and of a constant irresolution against sin. Fifth, the rich and precious box of a good conscience is polluted and made impure if just one dead fly is allowed into it. One sin being quietly permitted and allowed to live in the soul without being disturbed, resisted, resolved against, or lamented over, will certainly mar the peace of a good conscience. Sixth, where any one sin is nourished and fostered, all our other graces are not only blemished, but abolished. They become no grace at all. Seventh, most true is that saying of Aquinas, all sins are coupled together, though not in regard of conversion to temporal good, or some look to the good of gain, and some of glory, and some of pleasure. But in regard of aversion from eternal good, that is God. He that looks toward just one sin is as much averted and turned back from God as if he looked to all. 
in which respect James says, He that offendeth in one is guilty of all. James chapter 2, verse 10. Now, lest you make Aquinas or the scripture he cites, I'm sorry, now lest you mistake Aquinas or the scripture he cites, you must remember that the whole law is but one copulative. A CF, uh, Ezekiel 18, verses 10 through 13. And thus he who habitually breaks one command, he breaks them all, though not so actually. Just as those who are truly godly in respect of the habitual desires, purposes, bents, biases, inclinations, resolutions, and endeavors of their souls are said to keep the very commands they actually break daily. But the corrupted conscience does not keep any of the commandments of God. He that willingly, willfully, and habitually gives himself liberty to break any one commandment is guilty of breaking them all. Remember that, Sabbath breakers? Remember that. I said that, he didn't. That is, either he breaks the chain of duties and so breaks all the law, being copulative, or with the same disposition of heart that he willingly willfully and habitually breaks one commandment, he also is ready and predisposed to break them all. Certainly, the Apostle's meaning in James chapter 2 verse 10 is this. Suppose a man kept the whole law in its substance except in one particular area by allowing himself to violate in this particular area, he reveals that he has kept no precept of the law in obedience and conscience unto God. For if he did, then he would be careful to keep every precept. The words which follow imply as much, and thus by it he reveals that he is guilty of breaking all of God's law. Others conceive that such a man may be said to be guilty of breaking all of God's law because by allowing himself to remain in any one sin, he lies under the curse which is, thre uh, which is threatened against the transgressors of the law. Deuteronomy 27, verse 26. Eighthly, every Christian should carry in his heart, says another, a constant and resolute purpose not to sin in anything. For faith and the purpose of sinning can never stand together. Well, this must be understood of a, a habitual and constant, not transient, purpose. Ninthly, one flaw in a diamond, one says, takes away the luster and the price. Well, one puddle, if we wallow in it, will defile us. One man in law may keep possession. One piece of ward, of ward land makes the heir liable to the king. So also, one sin that is lived in and allowed may make a man miserable forever. Tenthly, one turn may bring a man quite out of the way. One act of treason maketh a traitor. Gideon had seventy sons, only one of them being a bastard. And yet that one bastard destroyed all the rest. Judges chapter 8 verse 31. One sin, as well as one sinner, one sin lived in and allowed may destroy much good, says another. Eleventh. He that favors one sin, though he abstains from many, does only as Ben-Hadad did, to recover from one disease and yet die of another. 2 Kings uh, chapter 8. Yea, he is only taking pains in his going to hell. Twelfth, by one lie to our first parents, Satan made fruitless what God himself had preached to them immediately before. Thirteenth, a man may, 
by one short act of sin, bring a long curse upon himself and his posterity, even as Ham did when he saw his father Noah drunk. And Noah awoke from his wine, and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed is Canaan. A servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. Genesis chapter 9, verses 24 through 25. Now Canaan was Ham's son. Noah, as God's mouth, prophesied a curse upon this son for his father's sin. Here, Ham is cursed through his son, Canaan. And the curse applied not only to Canaan, but to his posterity. Noah prophesies a long chain and a series of curses upon Canaan and his children by making the curse hereditary, for it applied to the name and the nation of the Canaanites. Quote, A servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren, close quote. And that is the most vile and base of all servants. For the Hebrews express the superlative degree by such a duplication as vanity of vanities, which means the most vain. A song of songs, which means the most excellent song. And thus, it is that a servant of servants means the most base and vile of all servants. What a heavy and prodigious curse is pronounced on the account of one sin. Fourteenth, Satan is content that men should yield to God in many things, provided that they will only be true to him in one thing. For he knows very well that as one dram of poison is enough to kill a horse, and one stab at the heart is enough to kill a man, so one sin unrepented of, or one sin allowed, retained, cherished, and practiced, will certainly be enough to damn a man. Fifteenth. Though all the other parts of a man's body may be sound, if only one is diseased and ulcerous, that part may prove to be deadly. For all the sound members cannot preserve your life when that one diseased and ulcerous member works to hasten your death. And so also, one sin that is allowed, indulged, and lived in will ultimately kill and damn you. Sixteenth, observe, says another, that an unmortified sin allowed and willfully retained will eat out all the appearance of virtue and piety. Herod's high esteem of John and his ministry and his eager performance of many good deeds all these things are given over and laid aside at the command of his master sin, his reigning sin. John's head must go for it, if he won't let Herod enjoy his Herodias quietly. Seventeenth. Some will leave all their sins, but one. Jacob would let all his sons go, but Benjamin. Satan can hold a man fast by one sin that is allowed and lived in, even as the fowler can hold the bird securely by one wing or foot. Eighteenth, Polycarp, in the time of the fourth persecution, when he was commanded but to swear one oath, he made this answer. Four score and six years have I endeavored to do God's service, and all this while he never heard me. How then can I speak evil of so good a Lord and Master who has thus long preserved me? I am a Christian and cannot swear. Let heathens and infidels swear if they will. I cannot do it. Were it to be the saving of my life. Nineteenth. A willing and a willful keeping up of any known transgression against the Lord, either in heart or life, is a breach of the holy law of God. It is to fight against the honor and glory of God, and it is a reproach to the eye of God, the omnipresence of God. 
20th. The keeping up of any known transgression against the Lord may endanger the souls of others and may be a fighting against all the cries, prayers, tears, promises, vows, and covenants that you have made to God when you had been upon the sickbed, in imminent danger, near death, or when you were solemnly seeking the Lord. This thought should be frequently and seriously considered by those poor fools who are entangled in any lust. 21st. The keeping up of any known transgression against the Lord, either in heart or life, is a strong incentive for Satan to tempt the soul. It will also greatly unfit the soul for all sorts of duties and services that he either owes to God, himself, or others. It puts a sting into all a man's troubles, afflictions, and distresses. It lays a foundation for despair, and it will make death, which is the king of terrors and the terror of kings, to be very terrible to the soul. Twenty-second. The keeping up of any known transgression against the Lord, either in heart or life, will fight against all the patterns and examples in Holy Scripture that in duty and honor we are bound to imitate and follow. Where do you find in any of the blessed scriptures that any of the patriarchs, prophets, apostles, or saints were ever charged with a willing or a willful keeping up, either in their hearts or lives, of any known transgression against the Lord. 23rd. The keeping up of any known transgression against the Lord will work against your clear, sweet, and standing communion with God. Parents do not often smile at their children, nor act as familiar with them, nor keep up any intimate communion with them when they neglect their duty and are disobedient. Well, the same is true here. 24th. The keeping up of any known transgression against the Lord, either in heart or life, will fight against the standing joy, peace, comfort, and assurance of the soul. Joy in the Holy Spirit will make its nest nowhere but in a holy soul. So far as the Spirit is grieved, he will suspend his consolations. Lamentations, chapter 1, verse 16. A man will have no more comfort from God than to the extent that he makes it a point not to sin against God. A conscience which has integrity also has tranquility. If our hearts do not condemn us, then we have confidence toward God. 1 John chapter 3, verse 21, CF, Acts chapter 24, verse 16. And I may say also toward men, Oh, what comfort and solace are found in a clear conscience. That man has something within him to answer his accusations from without. I shall conclude this particular with a notable saying of Bernard, with Bernard if you're English. Quote, The joys of a good conscience are the paradise of souls, the delight of angels, the garden of delights, the field of blessing, the temple of Solomon, the court of God, and the habitation of the Spirit. Close quote. 25th. The keeping up of any known transgression against the Lord, either in heart or life, shows a high degree of contempt for the all-seeing eye of the omnipresent God. It is well known what the great king Ahasuerus said concerning Haman, when he came in and found him lying upon the queen's bed, upon which she sat. What? he said. Will he force the queen before me in the house? Esther chapter 7 verse 8 There was the killing emphasis in the words before me. Will he force the queen before me? What? Will he dare to commit such villainy while I stand here and look on it? 
all Christian. To do wickedly in the sight of God is a thing that he looks upon as the greatest affront and indignity that can possibly be done to him. What? He says, will you be drunk before me? Swear and blaspheme before me? Be unchaste and lewd before me? Breaking my laws before my eyes? And this is the fatal aggravation of all sin, that it is done before the face of God and in the presence of God. The very consideration of God's omnipresence that he stands and looks on should act as an obstacle or hindrance which stops the proceeding of all wicked intentions, a dissuasive from sin rather than the least encouragement unto it. It was an excellent saying of Ambrose, quote, If you cannot hide yourself from the sun, which is God's minister of light, then how impossible will it be to hide yourself from him whose eyes are 10,000 times brighter than the sun? Close quote. God's eye is the best marshal to keep the soul in a suitable condition. Let thine eye be always upon him whose eye is always upon thee. The eyes of the Lord are in every place. Beholding the evil and the good. Proverbs 15, verse 9. You cannot draw a curtain between yourself and God. God is totus oculus, all eye. He sees all things in all places and at all times. When you are in secret, consider that your conscience which is more than a thousand witnesses, is present, and that God, which is more than a thousand consciences, is also present. It was the clever idea of one that he should have his chamber painted full of eyes, so that whichever way he looked, he would still have eyes upon him. And by this he was reminded that he was always under the eye of a keeper, and so hoped to be more careful of his conduct. Oh, Christian, if the eyes of men make even the most vile to refrain from their beloved lusts for a while, even as the adulterer waits for the twilight, and the drunkards do their drinking at night, how powerful should the eye and presence of God be to those that fear his anger and know the sweetness of his favor? The thought of the omnipresence of God will frighten you from sin. Gehazi dares not ask for or receive any part of Naaman's presence in his master's presence. But when he was out of Elisha's sight, then he tells his lie and gives way to his lusts. 2 Kings verse 5 Men never sin more freely than when they presume upon secrecy. They break in pieces thy people, O Lord, and afflict thy heritage. They slay the widow and the stranger, and murder the fatherless. Yet they say, The Lord doth not see, neither shall the God of Jacob regard it. That's Psalm 94, verses 5-7. through seven. Those who abound in abominations said, quote, The Lord seeth us not, the Lord hath forsaken the earth. Close quote. Ezekiel chapter 8, verses 9 and 12. The wise man is dissuaded from wickedness upon the consideration of God's eye and omniscience. And why wilt thou, my son, be ravaged with a strange woman, and embrace the bosom of a stranger? For the ways of man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he pondereth all his goings. Proverbs chapter 5, verses 20 through 21. Joseph saw God in the room, and therefore did not dare yield. But his mistress saw no one but Joseph, and so a lord intended him to folly with imprudence, or with impudence. Genesis chapter 39, verses 6 through 9. I have read of two religious men that took contrary courses with two lewd women, whom they hoped to reclaim from their immoral way of living. One of the men told one of the women that he would like to enjoy her company, 
so long as it might be done in secret. And when she had brought him into a private room, so that none could look into it, he told her, All the bars and bolts here cannot keep God out. The other asked the other woman to have intercourse with him openly, out of the streets, which when she rejected it as a mad request, he told her, It would be better to do it before the eyes of a multitude than before the eyes of God. Oh, how the presence of the God who hates sin should make us too ashamed to sin and too afraid to dare him to his face to punish us with hell flames. Number 26. There have been many a prodigal who, by one cast of the dice, have lost a promising inheritance. A man may be killed by one stab of a penknife, one hole in a ship may sink it, and one thief may rob a man of all he has in this world. A man may escape many gross sins, and yet by living in the allowance of one particular sin, he may be deprived of the glory of heaven forever. Moses came within the sight of Canaan, but because of one sin, not sanctifying God's name, he could not enter it. And it will be no less for any man that lives in any one sin. He shall be forever shut out of the kingdom of heaven. Now this is not the same as having some remainder of sin, or the heart is set in opposition to it. But if there is any secret agreement with any one sin, then all the profession of godliness and the leaving of all other sins will be to no purpose, nor will it ever bring a man to happiness. 27th As the philosopher says, a cup that has a hole in it is no cup. It will hold nothing, and therefore cannot function as a cup, though it has but one hole in it. And so also, if the heart has but one hole in it, if it retains the devil in just one thing, if it makes the choice to lie and wallow in just one sin, it evacuates all the other good by the entertainment of that one sin. The whole jar of ointment will be spoiled by dropping just one fly into it. And by the laws of our kingdom, a man can never have any true possessions until he has voided all his debts. In the state of grace, no man can have a full interest in Christ until all sin, that is all reigning and domineering sin, is rooted out. Thus you see the concurrent judgments of our most famous divines against the allowing, indulging, or retaining of any one known sin against the light of conscience. But in order that these sayings may lie with more weight and power upon the poor soul that is entangled with any such lust, seriously and frequently consider the following particulars. Number one. First, it is to no purpose for a man to turn from some sins, if he does not turn from all sins. Quote, If any man among you seem to be religious, and bridles not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is in vain. Close quote. James chapter 1 verse 26. At first sight, this may seem to be a hard saying, that for one fault in the tongue, all a man's religion should be counted vain. And yet, this is what the Holy Spirit imperatively concludes. Let a man make ever so glorious a profession of religion, yet if he gives himself liberty to live in the practice of any known sin, yea, though it be but a sin of the tongue, his religion is in vain, and that one sin will separate him from God forever. If a wife is ever so officious to her husband in many things. Yet if she entertains any other lover in her bed besides him, it will forever alienate his affections from her and make an everlasting separation between them. The application of this is obvious. And to turn from one sin to another is to be tossed from one hand of the devil to another. It is with Ben-Hadad to recover from one disease and yet to die of another. 2 Kings chapter 8. 
It is to take pains in going to hell. If a ship springs three leaks and only two are plugged, the third will sink the ship. Or if a man has two grievous wounds in his body and only binds up one of them, then the one which is neglected will certainly kill him. And the same is true here. Herod, Judas, Saul, and the scribes and Pharisees have experienced this truth for many hundred years. Number two. Second. Partial obedience is indeed no obedience. It is only universal obedience that is true obedience. Quote, All that the Lord hath said will we do, and be obedient. Close quote. That's Exodus chapter 24, verse 7. Those who take care to do all that is commanded are the only ones who are indeed obedient. For to obey is to do that which is commanded, because it is commanded. Though the thing done is commanded, yet if it is not therefore done because it is commanded, it is not obedience. Now if this is the nature of obedience, then where there is truly obedience, it is not partial, but universal. For he that does any one thing that is commanded because it is commanded, he will be careful to do everything that is commanded, because the same reason is behind all of his acts of obedience. Those that are only for a partial obedience break apart the bond and reason for all obedience. For all obedience is to be founded upon the authority and will of God, because God who has authority over all his creatures, wills and commands us to obey his voice and to walk in his statutes. For this very reason, we stand bound to obey him. And if we obey him for this reason, then we must walk in all his statutes. For this he has commanded us. And if we will not come up to this, but only walk in whichever of his statutes we please, then we renounce his will as the obliging reason for our obedience. And we set up our own liking and pleasure as the reason for it. God has connected the duties of his law to one to another in such a way that if there is not a conscientious care to walk according to all that it, uh, all the law requires, a man becomes a transgressor of the whole law. Quote, Whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point is guilty of all. Close quote. James chapter 2, verse 10. The bond of it, all is broken. The authority of it, all is slighted. And the evil disposition and sinful frame of heart that causes a man to venture upon the breach of one command would make him venture upon the breach of any command if it were not for some infirmity of nature because his purse would not hold out to maintain for it for some loss or shame in the eyes of friends or the sword of the magistrate or for some other sinister respects. He that gives himself liberty to live in the breach of any one commandment of God is qualified with a disposition of heart to break every last one of them. Every single sin contains virtually all sin within it. He that allows himself liberty to live in the breach of any one particular law of God casts contempt and scorn upon the authority that made the whole law and upon this account breaks it all. The apostle gives the reason for this in verse 11. Quote, For he that said, Do not commit adultery, said also, Do not kill. Close quote. Now if you commit no adultery, but kill, you have become a transgressor of the law. It is not that you're guilty of it 
all distributively, but rather collectively, for the law is copulative. There is a chain of duties, and they are all linked to one another, so that you cannot break one link of the chain without breaking the whole chain. And thus it is that no man can live in the breach of any known command of God without also wronging every command of God. He that does not regard all the commandments of God has no real regard for any of them. There is one and this same lawgiver in respect to all the commandments. He that gave one command also gave the others. Therefore, the man that observes one commandment with a motivation of obedience unto the God who commanded it, this man will observe, observe them all because they are all his commandments. And he that slights one commandment is guilty of breaking them all, because he condemns the authority of the one that gave them all. Even in the commandments that he does observe, he has no respect for the will and authority of the one that gave them. And so, as Calvin has well observed upon James chapter 2, verses 10 through 11, quote, There is no obedience toward God where there is not also a uniform endeavor to please God in one thing as well in another. Close quote. Number three. Thirdly, partial obedience tends to plain atheism. For by the same reason that you slight the will of God in any commandment, you may also despise his will in every commandment. For every commandment of God is his will. It is holy, spiritual, just, and good. Romans chapter 7 verses 12 and 14. And contrary to our sinful lusts. And if this is the reason that certain commandments of God will not prevail upon you, then by the same reason you account none of them as having authority over you. Fourth, number four, God requires universal obedience. Quote, Walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well unto you. Close quote. Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 23 teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. You see also Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 33, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12, and also Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 22 and 23. Number five. Fifthly, partial obedience is an audacious charge against God himself as it pertains to his wisdom, power, and goodness. For either the statutes of God, which you will not yield to, are as righteous, holy, spiritual, and good as the rest, or they are not. Now, if they are as holy, spiritual, just, righteous, and good as the rest, then why do you not walk in them as well as in the others? But to say that they are not as holy, spiritual, just, righteous, or good as the rest, oh, what a blasphemous charge this is against God himself. For this is to prescribe to him something that is not righteous, good, holy, just, or spiritual. And likewise makes his will which is the rule of all righteousness and goodness, out to be something which is partly righteous and partly unrighteous, partly good and partly bad. Number six. Sixth, God delights in universal obedience and in those that perform it. Quote, Oh, that there were such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, close quote. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 29. Well, upon this account, Abraham is called the friend of God, 
in Scripture three different times. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 8, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 7, and James chapter 2, verse 23. And upon the very same account, God called David a man after his own heart. I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. That's Acts chapter 13, verse 22. All my wills denote the universality and the sincerity of his obedience. Number seven. Seven. There is not any one statute of God that is not good or for our own good. Therefore, we should walk in all his statutes. Quote, Ye shall walk in all the ways which the Lord your God hath commanded you, that you may live, and that it may be well with you. Close quote. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 33. What one path has the Lord commanded us to walk in that has not been for our own good as well as his own glory? Is it not good for us to love the Lord, to set him up as the object of our fear, to act in faith upon him, to worship him in spirit and in truth, to be tender of his glory, and to sanctify his day, keeping away from sin and close to his ways? Number eight. Universal obedience is the condition upon which the promise of mercy and salvation runs. Quote, If the wicked will turn from all his sins that he hath committed, and keep all his statutes, and do that which is lawful and right, he shall surely live, he shall not die. Close quote. It's Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 21. Number nine. Our hearts must be perfect with the Lord our God. Quote, Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. Close quote. Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 13. And see also Genesis chapter 17 verse 1. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Now, how can our hearts be said to be perfect with God if we equivocate with him? If in some things we obey him, and in other things we will not obey him? If we walk in some of his statutes, but will not walk in all of them? If we will be his servants in some part of our lives, yet in another part we are the servants of sin? Number ten. If the heart is sound and upright, it will yield entire and universal obedience. Quote, Let my heart be sound in thy statutes, that I may not be ashamed. Close quote. Psalm 119, verse 80. And then also verse 6. Then shall I not be ashamed when I have respect to all thy commandments. By these verses, compared together, it is apparent that the heart is sound and sincere when a man has respect unto all of God's commandments. Without our universal obedience, a man can never have the hope which maketh not ashamed. Number 11. We must either endeavor to walk in all the statutes of God, or else we must find some dispensation or toleration from God to free us excuse us, and hold us indemnified for not walking in all of them. Now, what commandment is there from which God will excuse any man or will not punish him for the neglect of obedience unto it? Well, the apostle says that whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. James chapter 2 verse 10. If he equivocates with God over any one particular commandment, his heart is nothing. And he's guilty of it all. 
he has no regard of any of the rest of God's laws. Number 12. The precious saints and servants of God, whose examples are recorded and set forth for our imitation, have been very careful to perform universal obedience. Can you not see it in Abraham, who was ready to comply with God in all his royal commands, when God commanded him to leave his country and his father's house, he did it. Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. When God commanded him to be circumcised, though it was both shameful and painful, he submitted unto it. Genesis chapter 17. When God commanded him to send away his son Ishmael, though when Sarah spoke to him about it, it was very grievous unto him, Yet as soon as he saw it to be the will of God, he was obedient unto it. Genesis chapter 21, verses 8 through 14. When God commanded him to sacrifice his son Isaac, his only son, the son of his old age, the son of the promise, the son of his delight, yea, the son from whom Jesus was to arise, in whom all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And though all this might seem to cross both nature and grace, reason and religion, yet Abraham was willing to obey God in this also, and to do what he commanded. Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 12. Also David was a man after God's own heart, who fulfilled all his will. Acts chapter 13, verse 22. And it is said of Zechariah and Elizabeth that they walked in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord. Luke chapter 1 verse 6. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 10. Number 13. Universal obedience speaks of the strength of our love for Christ and the reality of our friendship with Christ. Ye are my friends if ye do whatsoever I command you. That's John chapter 15, verse 14. The child that observes all his father's precepts is the one that shows the most love to his father. The servant that observes all his master's commands is the one that shows the most love for his master. And the wife that observes all her husband requires in the Lord is the one that shows the most love to her husband. And the same is true for those who love Christ. Number 14. Universal obedience will give the most peace, rest, quiet, and comfort to the conscience. Such a Christian will be like an eye that has no speck to trouble it, as a kingdom that has no rebellion to disturb it, as a ship that has no leak to sink it. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. That's Psalm 119, verse 165. Number 15. Man's holiness must be conformable to God's holiness. Be ye followers of God as dear children. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 through 2. Be ye perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Matthew chapter 5, verse 48. Now, God is righteous in all his ways, and holy in all his works. Psalm 145, verse 17. And so ought we, who desire to be saved, endeavor to be also. As he who hath called you is holy, so be ye also holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, 
Be ye holy, for I am holy. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 through 16. Number 16. The holiness of a Christian must be conformable to the holiness of Christ. Be ye followers of me, as I am of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. Now Christ was holy in all things. It behooveth us, he said, to fulfill all righteousness. Matthew chapter 3, verse 15. And it should be the care of each one that professes himself to be Christ's, that he endeavors to be holy as Christ is holy. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself to walk even as he walked. 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. Number 17. Servants must obey their earthly masters, not, all, not in some things only, but in all things, at least in all things that are just and lawful. Exhort servants to be obedient to their own masters and to please them well in all things. Titus chapter 2, verse 9. What master will be content with a servant that chooses to what extent he will observe and do the things which his master requires of him? Much less will such arbitrary and partial performances please God, who is our heavenly master. Well, number 18. The promises of mercy, both spiritual and temporal, are made on the condition of universal obedience. Carefully examine and consider each of these promises. 1 Kings chapter 6 verses 12 through 13. Deuteronomy chapter 28 verses 1 through 3. Ezekiel chapter 18 verses 21 through 22 and also 27 through 28. Number 19. One sin never goes alone, as you may see in the falls of Adam and Eve, Lot, Abraham, Noah, Jacob, Joseph, Job, David, Solomon, Peter, Ahab, Judas, and Jeroboam. One sin will make way for more, even as one little thief can open the door to let in many larger ones. Satan will be sure to nest himself and lodge in the least sins, even as birds nest and lodge themselves in the smallest branches of the tree. And there he will do all he can to hatch every kind of wickedness. A little wedge prepares the way for a larger one, and little sins make way for greater ones. Number 20. The reasons for turning from sin are universally binding to a gracious soul. There are are the same reasons and grounds for a penitent man's turning away from every sin as there are for his turning from any one particular sin. Do you turn from a certain sin because the Lord has forbidden it? Well, upon the same ground you must turn from every sin. For God has forbidden every sin, as well as this or that particular sin. The same authority forbids and commands in all. And if the authority of God restrains a man from one sin, it should restrain him from all of them. Number 21. One sin allowed and lived in will keep Christ and the soul apart, even as one rebel or traitor 
kept hidden in the house will keep a prince and his subjects apart. Or as one stone in the pipe will keep the water and the cistern apart. Number 22. One sin allowed and lived in will make a person unfit for suffering, even as one cut or shot in the shoulder may hinder a man from bearing a burden. Will a man ever lay down his life for Christ, and if he cannot and will not lay down a lust for him? Number 23. One sin allowed and lived in is sufficient to deprive a man of the greatest good forever. One sin allowed and wallowed in will just as certainly deprive a man of the blessed vision of God. All of the treasures, pleasures, and delights that are at God's right hand as a thousand. One sin stripped the fallen angels of all their glory, and one sin stripped our first parents of all their dignity and excellence. Genesis chapter 3, verses 4 through 5. One fly in the precious ointment spoils the whole jar. One thief may rob a man of all his treasure. One disease may deprive a man of all his health. And one drop of poison will spoil the whole glass of wine. And so also, one sin allowed and lived in will make a man miserable forever. One millstone will sink a man to the bottom of the sea just as well as a hundred. And the same is true here. Number 24. One sin allowed and lived in will eat out all a man's peace of conscience. As one note that is misplayed will spoil the sweetest music. And so one sin countenanced and lived in will spoil the music of conscience. One pirate may rob a man of all he has in this world. Number 25, and lastly, the sinner would have God to forgive him, not only of some of his sins, but of all his sins. And therefore, it is proper that he should turn from all his sins. If God is faithful and just to forgive us all our sins, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, we also must be faithful and just in turning from all our sins. The plaster must be as broad as the sore, and the dressing as long and deep as the wound. It argues horrid hypocrisy, damnable folly, and wonderful impudency for a man to beg the pardon of those very sins that he is resolved never to forsake. Here's an objection. But it is impossible for any man on earth to walk in all God's statutes, to obey all his commands, to do his will in all things, and to walk according to the full breadth of God's royal law. The solution. Well, I answer, there is a twofold walking in all the statutes of God. There is a twofold obedience to all the royal commands of God. Number one, the first is in a legal sense, in which all that God requires is done. And there is not one path of duty that we do not walk in perfectly and continually. This no man on earth can do. For no man can walk in all of God's statutes, or fully do everything he commands. Quote, For in many things we offend all, close quote, James chapter 3, verse 2. And so also in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 20. There is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. And also 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 46. For there is no man that sinneth not. 
and also Proverbs chapter 20, verse 9. Who can say, I have made my heart clean, I am pure from my sin? And also Job 14, verse 4. Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Well, not one. And finally, 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Well, number two, the second sense of it is evangelical, in which we walk in all the statutes of God and keep all the commands of God in such a way that in Christ it is accepted and accounted of as though we did indeed keep them all. This is walking in all of God's statutes and keeping all of his commandments and doing them all it is not only possible, but is also actual in every believer that is, in every sincere Christian. And it consists in these particulars. Letter A. First, the approval of all the statutes and commandments of God. The commandment is holy and just and good. I consent unto the law that it is good. Romans chapter 7, verses 12 and 16. There is both assent and consent. I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right. Psalm 119, verse 128. A sincere Christian approves of all divine commands, even though he cannot keep them all perfectly. Letter B. Second. In a conscientious submission, to the authority of all the statutes of God. Every commandment of God has authority in and over his heart. My heart standeth in awe of thy word. Psalm 119, verse 161. A sincere Christian stands in awe of every known command of God and has a spiritual regard for them all. I have respect unto all thy commandments. Psalm 119, verse 6. Letter C. Third, it consists in a cordial willingness and desire to walk in all the statutes of God and to obey all the commands of God. For to will is present with me. Romans chapter 7, verse 18. Oh, that my ways were directed to keep thy statutes. Psalm 119, verse 5. And also in verse 8. I will keep thy statutes. Letter D. Fourth. It consists of a sweet complacency in all of God's commandments. I will delight myself in thy commandment which I have loved. Psalm 119, verse 47. I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Romans chapter 7, verse 22. Fifth, he who obeys uh, sincerely, he who obeys sincerely, obeys universally, though not in regard to practice, which is impossible. Yet in regard of affection, he loves all the commandments of God. He's talking about the elect here. Yea, he dearly loves the very commandments of God that he cannot obey because of the weakness of the flesh, and because of the body of sin and death that he carries around with him. Ponder upon Psalm 119, verse 97. Oh, how I love thy law. He felt such a pang of love that it could not be vented in any other way, but by his moving exclamation. Oh, how I love thy law. And consider also verses 113, 163, 127, 159, and 167. And before I go to number six, we would today and today would consider someone who is a sincere Christian as a regenerate Christian. Because there's a lot of different ideas about sincerity and everything else which probably weren't existing in the time of Thomas Brooks, or at least he didn't recognize it like that. So when Brooks is saying a sincere Christian, he's meaning a regenerate Christian. 
which is the only kind of Christian. Number six, a sincere Christian obeys all the commands of God. He is universal in his obedience with respect to valuation or esteem. He highly values and prizes all the commandments of God, as you may clearly see by examining these scriptures. Psalm 119, verse 72, verses 127 through 128. Psalm 19, verses 8 uh, through 11, and also Job, chapter 23, verse 12. Number seven, a sincere Christian is universal in his obedience with respect to his purpose and resolution. He purposes and resolves by divine assistance to obey all and to keep all. I have sworn and will perform it that I will keep thy righteous judgments, Psalm 119, verse 106. I am purposed that my mouth shall not transgress, Psalm 17, verse 3. Number eight, a sincere Christian is universal in his obedience with respect to his inclination. He has a habitual inclination within him to keep all the commandments of God. 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 57 through 58. 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verses 17 through 20. I have inclined my heart to perform thy statutes always, even to the end. That's Psalm 119, verse 112. Number nine. Ninth and lastly, their evangelical keeping of all the commandments of God is found in their sincere endeavor to keep them all. They take care to observe all the ways and parts of doctrine, I'm sorry, of obedience. They do not willingly and wittingly slight or neglect any commandment, but are striving to conform themselves unto them, as a dutiful son does all his father's commands, at least in point of endeavor, so also do sincere Christians make a conscious effort to keep all the commands of God. In other words, they don't make excuses for them as to why they don't do it. I turn my feet unto thy testimonies. Psalm 119, verse 59. God regards evangelical obedience as perfect obedience. Zechariah had his failings. He hesitated through unbelief, and for it he was struck dumb. Yet the text tells you that he, quote, walked in all the commandments of the Lord blameless, close quote, Luke chapter 1, verse 6. Why is that? Because he earnestly desired and endeavored to obey God in all things. Evangelical obedience is true for the essence of, though not perfect for the degree. A child of God obeys all the commands of God with respect to all his sincere desires, purposes, resolutions, and endeavors. And God, through Christ, accepts this as perfect and complete obedience. This is the glory of the covenant of grace, that God accepts and esteems of sincere obedience as perfect obedience. Those who sincerely endeavor to keep the whole law of God, keep the whole law of God in an evangelical sense, though not in a legal sense. A sincere Christian is for the first table of the law as well as the second and the second as well as the first. He does not adhere to the first and neglect the second, as the hypocrites do, nor does he adhere to the second and condemn the first, as profane men do. Oh, Christian, for your support and comfort, know that when your desires and endeavors are to do the will of God entirely, and you labor to do one thing as well as another, God will, 
graciously pardon your failings and pass by your imperfections. He will spare you as a man spareth his son that serveth him. Malachi chapter 3 verse 17 Though a father see his son fail and come short in many things which he commands him to do, yet knowing that his desires and endeavors are to serve him and to please him in the fullest, he will not be rigid and severe with him but will be lenient with him, sparing him, pitying him, and showing all manner of love and kindness to him.